well. <laughs> it's a long one. Hey everybody, welcome to Breakfast Club and welcome to our returning guest, uh, Ryan Wyatt, director of our Morrison Planetarium. Hey Ryan. Good morning, how are you doing? Pretty good. Um, so we're really excited to have Ryan back, Ryan back with us today. Um, and he, you know, actually for folks who weren't with us last time, can you just give, introduce us to what work people are gonna see today? Sure, so um, once a month in Morrison Planetarium, we deliver a program called Universe Update. And we talk about the latest astronomy news. And because astronomy is changing so rapidly, like a lot of science, we always have interesting stories to cover. And so today we're bringing that online. So instead of being immersed in Morrison Planetarium, you'll have a chance to see this on your home computer monitor. And what we'll be doing is actually using, uh, it's almost like video game software for science. We're, we're actually using real time software. So I'm gonna be flying uh, through a three dimensional model of the universe that's populated with not only all of the most recent and accurate data, but also uh, data that we ingested specifically for this show uh, in order to share some of the latest breaking news in astronomy. Yeah, so this is really special because it's an experience you normally only get in the dome. And um, and it's just like, I said this last time as well, but what I've always been so struck by is just that it's a real, it's kind of the realest model we could possibly pilot you through in terms of what's really out there. So it's a pretty amazing experience. And um, in terms of space news, how has it been this month? Has it been exciting and uneventful? Yeah. It's actually, it's interesting because people have noticed that, um, so, so a lot of the, the stories that we highlight are ones that are kind of already published. And so mm -hmm. like all science, astronomy is peer reviewed. So you put together a, an idea paper with your colleagues, you submit it, it goes through a review process and then it gets published several months later, maybe as long as a year or so later. Mm -hmm. And so what we're seeing now is still the product of a lot of work that was already being done you know, several months ago. But what's interesting is that people are saying that the number of paper submissions to journals is increasing during this time. Uh, as people, um, uh, well, as some people have more time. What's interesting <laughs> is that what we've noted, at least in the astronomy world, is that um, female astronomers, many of whom are uh, dealing with more than just uh, keeping up with their tenure, uh, are not submitting uh, in as increasing numbers as their male colleagues. So it does highlight uh, some of the challenges of the time they're in as well. During this time specifically. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So they would be perhaps more burdened by childcare or things like that's, that. Yeah. That's sort of the assumption that, uh, that, that the astronomy Twitterverse is, uh, is interpreting it as. So it's, it's both a, uh, we're looking at maybe a boom coming up in the next several months, but also some, some challenges. Yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. I, w I don't like hearing about other people's productivity booms, like yeah. relative to mine during this period, but right. now I'm also outraged. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, to start the morning. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, I am excited to get the morning started. And I, before I hand it over, I will just remind people that as always, you can ask questions um, directly for Ryan just by leaving them in the comments uh, if you're watching on Facebook or in the chat box if you're watching on YouTube. And those can be about what you see today, but they can also just be general space questions that you've always wanted to ask. So we have a real wealth of information here. Feel free to tap that and we will um, hand it over to you and see you on the other side. Sounds great. That's right. So um, I'm gonna be piloting, as I said, through our digital model of the universe. And to do that, I'm actually just gonna, I mean, I'm happy to be in the corner of the screen for a while, but since most of the action is happening out in virtual space, I will uh, probably be um, showing you mostly the full screen of our, our digital software for a while. So we're actually starting here, and I will note too that you all occasionally see my, um, uh, my mouse here. I'll try to use that as a pointer, but I actually need it to pilot through our, our 3D model here. So, uh, so occasionally you'll see my mouse arrow, but I'll try to use that, uh, get rid of it when I can, and use it constructively when it's up there. Uh, we're actually joining the International Space Station here as a starting point. And I like to start shows here because it gives a human scale to what we're talking about. If you can imagine, people are on board uh, International, the International Space Station, the ISS, and they are um, doing work that astronauts do. Um, but what's important to know is that that's as far as humans go out into space these days. We're going to go a lot farther uh, because we're traveling through a virtual space. And it may look like we're... Uh, the ISS is sort of plummeting into, uh, into South America here, but that's not the case. What's happening is we're pulling away from our location around our digital Earth, our virtual Earth. Uh, and we can see now uh, the coastline of South America. Um, 
I always like turning things around a bit because uh, there is no up in space. So um, we're actually kind of looking at this at not the usual uh, globe in the classroom kind of angle. Uh, but that yellow trajectory around Earth represents the International Space Station, the ISS, in its orbit around our planet. And where I want to take you today is a lot farther out into space. Again, because this is a virtual model of the universe, we're not limited by the speed of light. Uh, we're not limited by uh, all of the constraints that we would have in real space, like radiation and things like that we're also going to talk about. Uh, so I can actually talk about some of the things that are going on in context of a trip from, that will take us from Earth on out to, I'm hoping maybe the cosmic microwave background, the most distant light that we can see in the universe. And to begin with here, we pulled away far enough from Earth to see this trajectory of uh, an object around Earth, and that's Earth's moon. Now, the moon is about 240,000 miles away, about 400,000 kilometers, if you use more civilized units. And that's a distance that light can traverse in about a second and a half. Now, I mention that because astronomers like to use light travel time as a standard kind of ruler for measuring distances because light travels at the same speed in the vacuum of space all the time. So it travels about 300,000 kilometers per second or about 166,000 miles per second. And so it traverses that distance from Earth to the moon in about a second and a half. So if you look at the full moon in the sky, you're seeing it as it was about a second and a half ago. So we call that one and a half light seconds. Um, and uh, for comparison, as we move farther uh, from our location home on Earth, uh, we just sort of bring things around so that we see now the sun come into view from the upper right hand side. And that distance from Earth to the sun, or so from Earth to the sun, is about eight and a half minutes in terms of light travel time. So light takes about eight and a half minutes to travel from Earth to the sun or vice versa. So when you look at the sun, not directly, uh, please, not without eye protection. You're seeing it as it was eight and a half minutes ago. So if you think about the distance from Earth to the moon, a second and a half, it's kind of like a brief pause in conversation. Distance from Earth to the sun is eight and a half minutes. Maybe it's a really quick lunch if you're in between Zoom meetings these days. You may not have enough time for, uh, for a nice long lunch, but uh, you might be able to finish something uh, in eight and a half minutes. Now, we're going to use that measurement as we get farther and farther from home. But I kind of want to dig in to address some of the, uh, uh, some of the concepts uh, that um, uh, will help us understand some of the most recent news stories. And the first one I'd like to highlight is actually um, that because people have only traveled, actually I didn't mention it, but only traveled out to the distance of the moon, physically, that's as far as humans have traveled out into space. So again, light travel time equivalent about a second and a half. We need other tools to explore the universe around us. Now we use spacecraft, so I'll be talking about some observations from spacecraft. And we also use our telescopes here on Earth to make observations, as well as telescopes in space, like Hubble Space Telescope. And all of those tools help us put together this picture of what's happening in the universe around us. Now the first thing I'd like to highlight is actually about the planet Jupiter. So uh, we have our inner planets here, uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Jupiter, uh, the largest planet in the solar system, and um, about a thousand times the size of Earth, is, um, is the next one out. And we're going to visit it in a moment. But one of the interesting observations that I'm going to highlight is actually an infrared observation. So what that is, is uh, what we're seeing now, I mean, the, the orbit lines around the sun are sort of diagrammatic. Uh, representing the orbits of, of the various planets. Uh, but what we're seeing in the background is, a, is what the night sky looks like or from Earth in visible light. But if we were to look in infrared light, uh, we would see something very different. This is from the Wide Field Infrared uh, Explorer. Uh, and uh, I'm just going that's a little faster than I intended. Uh, and so what we can see here is that that band of the Milky Way, and we'll get a different perspective on the Milky Way in a bit, uh, glows very brightly. We're still seeing Earth's orbit around the sun here, just as a, uh, as a kind of indicator in the foreground. Uh, but that is the warm glow uh, of, of gas in our galaxy. Infrared light highlights uh, what is not as hot as, uh, as the stars like the sun, uh, but somewhat cooler and more like the temperature of the dust from which planets form, more of the temperature of the molecular clouds from which stars form. And, uh, and so we're seeing these wispy green strands uh, in infrared light represent 
uh, the stuff that our galaxy is made out of that glows because it's warm it's not hot enough to ignite like a star is uh, but it might be for example uh, these loops that you see in some of the uh, parts of the image are caused by gas being sort of snow plowed uh, away from uh, regions where stars have died things like that but infrared light gives us a very different perspective on uh, the universe around us it's uh, light that is a little bit longer in wavelength than the wavelengths of light that we can see with our eyes uh, and it, it's lower energy light so it allows us to uh, to see kind of warm things in the universe so what i'd like to do now is take you to the planet jupiter largest planet in our solar system in a fascinating place because this gas giant is not a planet that has any solid surface it's not a planet uh, like earth uh, the orbits you're seeing here are the moons uh, some of the largest moons of jupiter we're kind of coming in toward the uh, south pole of jupiter and uh, you can see as we as we rotate around the planet you can see the banded structure uh, that is very characteristic of this giant planet the largest planet in our solar system I'm going to mention more about that, actually, not just in the context of planets, but also in the context of a very interesting object called a brown dwarf in a moment. Uh, you can actually even see, uh, this is just pure luck because I didn't plan this, uh, the uh, great red spots is a giant storm on Jupiter that is getting a little bit smaller. It used to be, you used to be able to, uh, if you can imagine, uh, if you would put Earth next to Jupiter, you would fit uh, maybe two or even three Earths uh, around uh, in, inside the Great Red Spot in the past, but it's getting a little smaller. This is actually uh, uh, an image of, uh, the, of Jupiter that's pieced together from Hubble images of Jupiter that was released a, about a year ago. And, uh, and this uh, shows a Great Red Spot that's not quite as great as it used to be. Uh, it's, uh, it's maybe only about one and a half Earth diameters uh, in size now. So this kind of storm system, these, these sort of uh, amazing um, cloud structures in that that we see around Jupiter, we understand from having space probes that have visited Jupiter right now, uh, the Juno spacecraft that I'll highlight in a moment is, uh, is in orbit around Jupiter, but we can also study this from Earth. And so what I wanna show you, now these, these bands, uh, it all kind of looks basically like a big sort of, it's actually a slightly squished sphere, but Jupiter's clouds, some of these, like the white clouds, are generally higher in altitude than the more reddish-brown clouds. Uh, and you can see a lot of the structure of swirls and loops and kind of storms that are raging around the, uh, the largest planet in our solar system. The image I want to show you, though, is an infrared image. Uh, it's taken by a telescope here on Earth called Gemini. And what's interesting here is that we see uh, this is a... a at about just for geeks out there about 4.7 microns that's a lot longer wavelengths than our eyes can see and it shows areas of the uh, uh of the atmosphere that are warmed uh basically by the energy coming out of the out of the planet and driving a lot of this these storms and the activity that we see uh, around jupiter and what uh, was released just this past month was an amazing announcement where observations such as this one from the gemini uh, telescope uh here on earth were combined with Hubble Space Telescope observations and observations from the Juno spacecraft. So that's the spacecraft again in orbit around Jupiter. And that allowed astronomers and planetary scientists to piece together what's happening when some of these storms are raging on the surface or on the upper atmosphere of the giant planet. And basically with this infrared image, we can see deeper into the atmosphere uh, than we can with optical light, with light visible light like Hubble is observing in uh, and Juno in, in contrast is using uh, even different detectors actually looking at radio wavelengths which are even longer in wavelength than um, than infrared to look for lightning on Jupiter and lightning is interesting because it shows where the atmosphere is probably the most turbulent so by combining these observations in optical infrared and radio wavelengths we're piecing together how Jupiter's atmosphere operates and this is a, a fantastic puzzle that's really uh, driven a lot of research over many years. So these combined observations, in fact, some of the astronomers working on this are right across the bay from us in San Francisco. They're over in Berkeley. And uh, these are really illuminating a lot of what is happening on the largest planet in our solar system. So really fascinating results uh, from the uh, this team using Juno spacecraft observations as well as observations from 
the Hubble Space Telescope and from uh, from Earth. I just want to show the uh, uh, the orbit of uh, the Juno spacecraft around Jupiter because it's kind of fascinating. If you uh, if you look at some of the beautiful images from Juno, uh, they only come out every couple months because the spe spacecraft actually spends most of its time out here. This is a, a series of orbits. Uh, that uh, Juno has made around Jupiter over the several, several years that it's been orbited around the, the giant planet. And so it sort of zips in, makes observations of Jupiter, and then escapes. And the reason it does that is because Jupiter actually has a very strong and kind of dangerous magnetic field. It would be dangerous for humans, but it's even dangerous for the electronic equipment on board Juno. So Juno tries to minimize its amount of time uh, close to the planet, collects a lot of data, and then spends a lot of time out here farther away uh, from Jupiter in order to um, send data back to Earth and also to sort of get a break from the intense radiation close to the planet. So that's an, uh, an announcement that's come from uh, here uh, in our solar system over the past month, a really fascinating result from this com combined work of Juno, Hubble Space Telescope, both of those out in space, Juno in orbit around Jupiter, uh, Hubble in orbit around Earth, and the Gemini, the Gemini Telescope uh, here on Earth's surface. The other solar system story I'd like to tell uh, before we get too far from home is about a really interesting class of objects, uh, a group of asteroids that might not be what you typically think of asteroids as being like. So uh, when we think about asteroids, we tend to think about the asteroid belt. Again, if uh, you probably, as you probably had on your placemat, maybe if you were uh, in grade school, uh, that's that uh, in between Mars and Jupiter, you find the asteroid belt. Um, that is indeed where the majority of asteroids in our solar system are found. And actually, they were kind of uh, shepherded here effectively by the gravity, gravitational influence of Jupiter, which prevented probably a planet from forming in that region. Uh, and so we have this cluttered mass of uh, little, often sort of potato-shaped objects that are ranging in size from, um, from basically small rocks and dust on the, up to uh, maybe a, a couple thousand kilometers across. The asteroid belt, again, is where we find most asteroids, but in fact, there are populations of asteroids that reside much farther from the sun, not inside the asteroid belt. And one of those groups of asteroids are called the centaur. So I'm gonna, uh, there aren't as many as there are in the asteroid belt, so I'm gonna highlight those with a little bit larger sort of uh, uh, representations. And what's fascinating about these is they are um, they're serious sort of um, uh, puzzles when it comes to um, what we refer to as their dynamics, the way they orbit the sun. It's a little hard to figure out uh, where they came from, what they're up to, because they don't seem to be very stable. They couldn't stay in their orbits for a very long time. The solar system is something like 4.5, 4.6 billion years old. And you'll notice that the orbits of the planets are all pretty much in the same plane because as the solar system formed, it flattened into a pancake. And the orbits of uh, the planets, the most, where most of the mass in the solar system is, is located, all end up in the same plane. But these objects um, are kind of like leftovers and, uh, and the centaurs have orbits that are very unusual. Now, just this month, uh, there was an announcement about 19 of these objects. And so here I'm highlighting their orbits. Now, unlike the planet orbits, I can't show you the direction that they're orbiting around the sun. Uh, one of the, the first of these that was discovered uh, has a, a wonderful Hawaiian name, Ka'epa Oka Aula, which is actually means um, the mischief maker around affiliated with Jupiter. And, and its orbit, again, I can't show you the direction of the orbit, but its orbit actually goes opposite all of the planets. So for example, if I go ahead and take away our orbit lines and our, uh, and our centaurs here for a moment, you'll notice that all the orbits are going in the same direction. So from this uh, perspective, they're kind of going counterclockwise around the sun. Well, it turns out that uh, at least one of these 19 objects whose orbits I'm, I'm, I'm showcasing here, uh, that aforementioned Ka'epa Okawa'uva, is orbiting opposite, in the opposite direction. But it's in a resonance, a one-to-one -one resonance with Jupiter, which means that every time Jupiter orbits, uh, that asteroid orbits in the same period. So something happened, and the story that has been pieced together and, and revealed in the last month or so 
is that these 19 objects seem to have come from a different solar system. They've been hanging out with our solar system since we formed 4.5, 4.6 billion years ago. But they actually came from other star systems, from other solar systems, because their orbits can't be explained any other way. These wild orbits that are carried far above and below the plane of the solar system, one of which is even going in the wrong direction, all seem to have resulted from these objects kind of having entered from a great distance from some other stellar system. Now, we've also seen some objects that have sort of zipped through our solar system, uh, only passing by, not sticking around. But these objects have been trapped by the sun's gravity uh, and probably residing with our solar system for the last billions, for billions of years. But they don't, they weren't part of that original gas cloud that formed uh, the sun and planet. So a really fascinating result uh, that uh, that's informing how we think about our solar system. Now, uh, those uh, observations are all coming from, as I mentioned, the Juno spacecraft and the uh, observations from here on Earth. Um, I want to go even farther out into space now. And to do that, I really want to emphasize how far we're really going. So um, so if we look at our, our, our orbits of the planets here, uh, again, we've got Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars down close to the Sun, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. If you look at the diameter of Neptune's orbit, it's a, it's a little less than but it's about eight light hours across. So remember, I mentioned that a second and a half in terms of light travel time from Earth to the Moon is maybe a brief pause in conversation. The eight and a half minutes from between Earth and the Sun is maybe a quick lunch. But eight light hours, you think about that, that's kind of like a good night's sleep, if you can imagine in terms of light travel time across the solar system. But the nearest star is about four light years away. So it takes light about four years to reach us from that star, Alpha Centauri. And that's a lot longer than eight hours. So the difference between interplanetary distances as measured by the diameter of Neptune's orbit and interstellar distances as measured by the distance to the nearest star is the difference between a good night's sleep, eight, light, eight hours, eight light hours, or a high school or college education, four light years. And so then the observations I'm going to be talking about here in a moment are ones that are coming to us uh, from studying the light from these distant objects and piecing together what's happening, even though we can't get a, an up-close view. And so um, I wanted to highlight here, just before we get too far away from home, the um, the five fastest spacecraft heading away from uh, our solar system, all five of these, we're showing their, their trajectories here, are traveling fast enough to escape the gravitational pull of the sun. But if you look, now that you know that this is about eight light hours from one side of Neptune's orbit to the other, if you look at how far they've traveled, none of them have traveled as far as light would travel in a single day. And yet some of these, four out of five actually, were launched back in the 70s, so they've been traveling for nearly 50 years in some cases. So our spacecraft just aren't fast enough to get us out into the universe. Instead, light, again, it travels at 300,000 kilometers per second or 166,000 miles per second, is what we need to study in order to understand the objects around us. So now really breaking the speed of light by pulling away from our location around the sun. And you're seeing the star of the sun as, as one of the many stars. We actually brightened it. Uh, to, uh, to match the other stars in our kind of solar neighborhood. And these are the stars that we can see from our night sky, but now we're seeing them in their three-dimensional relationships. Some are a little closer, some are farther away, and they're not all pasted onto a sphere uh, like, uh, like maybe medieval cosmologists might have imagined. Instead, it's a three-dimensional universe, and we're learning about objects uh, farther and farther from home. I actually want to start, though, with an object that's actually the, the third closest system to, uh, to Earth. I mentioned uh, that, um, that we have uh, Alpha Centauri, which is about four light years away. There's also uh, the bright star Sirius, which is about eight light years away. But then uh, I want to take you to um, an object called Lumen 16, and I'll highlight its location here. And it's about six and a half light years away. And I apologize because I said Sirius Sirius is actually a little farther away uh, than that. 
So uh, six and a half light years is pretty darn close in astronomy terms. And so what we want to do is actually go visit um, this object, which is actually two objects. So let me go ahead and remove our marker as we fly up close to uh, what turns out to be two kind of what we might think about as failed stars. They're two what we call brown dwarfs. Doesn't mean they're actually brown. It was a nickname that they uh, got before um, uh, before we were able to study them up close. Uh, so the two objects are, well, kind of popped on a little quick there, uh, Lumen A, uh, Lumen 16A, which is um, what we're looking at up close. And in the distance there, we can see Lumen 16B, uh, kind of over there here on the left. I'm highlighting, and these two objects are about the same size, they're orbit around one another. And, uh, and they're what we call brown dwarfs. Again, they're, they're not brown, they're probably not quite this orangey either. We were trying to fiddle with the appearance here, but um, the, the texture, the, the representation we're using here is actually direct from uh, NASA, our colleagues at uh, the Infrared Processing and Analysis Center uh, provided this, uh, this imagery to us. Uh, and it's an artist representation, so basically an, an informed kind of guess at what uh, what this object might look like. It probably glows softly in visible light, but a lot of its light is emitted in infrared light. As I mentioned, infrared is that wavelength of light uh, that's sort of cooler than stars emit. And, uh, and so the, the cool surface of Lumen A, we now know actually has banding. And that's what we're kind of showing here in terms of these alternating uh, bright and dark areas. And we can actually tell that, even though we can't resolve the star, we can't take a picture of the star. It's basically less than a pixel, even in our largest telescopes. What we can do, however, is study the light from Lumen A and Lumen B, its companion, and we notice variations in the brightness. And that variation in brightness can really only be described if the surface, uh, or really kind of upper atmosphere of Lumen A, has this kind of banded structure. And so what's amazing is, even from six and a half light years away, we can tease out what the object, give or take, kind of looks like based on the changing brightness over time. Uh, sorry, the little minute A kind of disappeared there. Uh, I'll just blame our computer software on that. Uh, it doesn't flicker in and out of existence so far as we know. Its brightness only varies slowly uh, as, we, um, uh, as we observe it in orbit around its companion, uh, Lumen B. So uh, let me go ahead now, we've pulled far enough away from our solar system uh, that, uh, that I'd actually just like to quickly highlight. Um, we, sh we showed you this brown dwarf. So it's basically, a, as I mentioned, kind of a failed star, a star that didn't, uh, isn't able to maintain uh, the thermonuclear reactions that power stars like the sun. Uh, and there are a lot of those in our, in our neighborhood. But of the stars you can kind of see drifting around the screen right here, Many of them, we are of course learning, have planets in orbit around them. So we have these little highlights, highlighters that we use uh, to show where planets are. And uh, uh, this gives you a sense of the thousands of planets that we've discovered in orbit around stars other than our sun. And since I mentioned those interstellar uh, companions, the asteroids out in the outer solar system that did not originate as part of the, uh, the sort of gaseous neb nebula from which the solar system formed. I also want to show, show you one of the most amazing images that was just released a couple days ago of a planetary system in formation. So these individual markers show a variety of extrasolar planets, planets in orbits around other stars. I'm going to talk about those actually uh, at our night school uh, nightlife program tonight and uh, I'll be able to kind of highlight a few of the most amazing discoveries from the past month. But I didn't want to leave you without connecting this to uh, what I was talking about earlier with those kind of uh, interstellar visitors to our own uh, solar system, those asteroids, those 19 asteroids that we see in orbit around the sun. So let me go ahead and take our exoplanets down here. And then what I'd like to do is uh, target what is uh, sort of not so certainly uh, easier to pronounce name uh, than, the, uh, than the Hawaiian name of the kind of interstellar visitor that I mentioned earlier. Uh, but it, the, uh, the star um, uh, is called 
um, sorry, trying to do too many things here at once. <laughs> and, uh, uh, the star is called Abia Rige. And uh, I apologize for this little flickering guy over here. What we did was we took the image that was released and we kind of put it in the location of the star uh, to its appropriate scale. So um, the distance here is actually across this is, is larger than our own solar system. So our own solar system would kind of be embedded in this swirl of gas here. This is an actual image of the, uh, of the Auriga AB system. Uh, and this is a star. We've actually kind of dimmed out the star itself, which is forming planets around it. Now, this image shows this kind of swirling structure. And basically, down here in where some of these swirls terminate uh, is where potentially large planets like Jupiter are taking shape in this sort of newborn planetary system. This is an amazing image, and we're getting more and more of these images. So as we, in the past 20 some odd years, we've been discovering planets around other stars. Now, in the last few years, we're beginning to make observations of the gas clouds out of which they form. And so if you can imagine, this is, um, a, uh, is a flat um, uh, sort of spiral of gas. And when the solar system was forming, uh, those objects, those 19 objects that, were, uh, uh, that were, are now in orbit around the sun were probably uh, on very long orbits that, uh, uh, that have slowly kind of spiraled in to, toward the center of the sun. So if you can imagine the sun might have looked something like this four and a half billion years ago when, uh, when the planets were forming around our own star. So an amazing image of uh, Uriga AB that, uh, uh, that shows um, planets forming around this other star. And now, before we get too far from home, I just want to visit one last place uh, in our Milky Way galaxy. And then we'll, uh, I did promise the, uh, the, uh, oops, sorry, the, uh, I did promise to uh, get you out to the cosmic microwave background. And so to do that, uh, we'll just wrap up the show here in a few minutes with that. But I want to show you one more location here in our own solar system. This is another announcement for the, from the past month. This marker shows the location of HR 6819, which is the kind of general kind of name that uh, objects get for things that represent catalog numbers more than anything else. Uh, and H HR 6819 is actually visible from Earth. What we're seeing is about, it actually lies about a thousand light years from home. Uh, but the stars here, and you can see them highlighted, two of them highlighted uh, here, one in a tight orbit toward the center, another one much farther out, um, are bright enough to be seen uh, with, uh, without a telescope. But their mo movement has, uh, has revealed that there's something else going on in this, in this system. And that's what's represented by this little arc here. So in fact, actually, to kind of illustrate this, let me go ahead and turn off that orbit. Uh, and I'm going to speed up time. And so what you can see is uh, that, uh, that one of these stars is moving rather rapidly, the other one quite slowly. And even just looking at this, it looks like there's something that's kind of missing. And what astronomers have deduced is that there is, in fact, a black hole in the system as well. Uh, the orbit here of this, uh, uh, this differently colored object is the orbit of the black hole. Um, this is a remnant of a star that once probably shined quite brightly, uh, but now, uh, as having reached the end of its life, it sloughed off the, uh, outer its outer layers, and what remains is basically uh, the core of the star, with the, which had sufficient density and mass to collapse into an object from which light cannot escape. Black holes are probably a subject of a lot longer than I have uh, time to talk about here in the, our universe update. But the fact of the matter is you can't see them directly. What instead you see is their influence on a system. In this case, the gravitational influence, particularly on this other inner star. So this outer star is kind of in orbit around both of uh, these inner objects. But uh, the motion of this inner star can really not be explained unless there's an unseen companion in the system. So this was just announced in the last couple of weeks. Uh, and 
at only a thousand light years away. This is actually the closest black hole to home. So uh, nothing to worry about. This is not like a giant black hole vacuum cleaner that's going to come speeding through the solar system anytime soon. Uh, but it's a fascinating object, the closest one uh, discovered to home, where we're seeing the gravitational influence of an unseen object, a black hole, that, uh, that is changing the orbits of its companion stars. Uh, so again, HR 6819, what is kind of cool is that if you decided to go out and have a good kind of sharp uh, eyes, you would actually maybe be able to tease out uh, that star amongst, uh, amongst many others. So with that said, I want to actually now take us outside our galaxy. I pointed out the Milky Way uh, in infrared light, uh, but now we're actually going to leave our collection of hundreds of billions of stars, and as we could tell from the uh, image from the WISE spacecraft, the uh, tremendous amount of gas and other stuff, a lot of activity going on in our sort of giant collection of hundreds of billions of stars in which we reside. Our Milky Way galaxy, and for comparison, since we've been using light travel time as a, as a, as a ruler, as a measuring stick, um, is about 100,000 light years from one side to the other. And where we are, uh, with the sun is about 35,000 light years from the center of our Milky Way galaxy. So what started out in terms of talking about light travel time, a second and a half from Earth to the moon, or from eight minutes, eight and a half minutes from the sun to Earth, or even four years in terms of the distance to the nearest star, those are all pretty human time scales that we can think about in our daily lives. 100,000 years or even 35,000 years from, the, from Earth to the center of the Milky Way. These are much greater distances, much longer time scales. So 35,000 years ago, right, distance from the center of the galaxy to where the sun is, people were painting the insides of caves. 100,000 years ago, our species hadn't even left Africa. So now we're getting to time scales that are really hard to wrap our heads around. And so now I just want to very quickly give you this kind of big picture before heading home and trying to answer some questions. And we've now pulled far enough away that the individual points that we see in the background are not stars, but actually galaxies. These, each point represents a galaxy which may contain hundreds of billions or even some as many of a, as a trillion stars. And what you can see, and, and I should note that they are not actually color coded, or right? you don't have a lot of blue galaxies, a lot of yellow, a lot of red galaxies. Instead, these are color coded based on their associations. Uh, the galaxies are kind of uh, gravitationally kind of hanging out together. And the ones that are uh, related are all color coded uh, with the same color. This is the work of the astronomer Brent Tully uh, at the University of Hawaii. Now, this cluster of red dots here is uh, the Virgo cluster of galaxies, it's kind of the nearest large cluster to our own with about a thousand galaxies in it. Uh, for comparison, the Milky Way galaxy resides in a collection of 50 uh, uh, some odd galaxies, what we call the local, uh, local group. And uh, so if, uh, if this is downtown San Francisco, we're kind of over in uh, Walnut Creek or something. So we don't live in kind of a intergalactic hotspot, uh, but this, uh, data set shows us the distribution of galaxies relatively close to home. And as we pull farther out yet, you can see that Virgo cluster is, a, is definitely a, an especially dense kind of clump of galaxies. But in fact, the galaxies sort of clump and cluster together. And that is what we refer to as the large scale structure of the universe. St galaxies are not uniformly distributed in space. Instead, they kind of clump and cluster together with regions where there aren't many galaxies at all. Now, I should note that uh, over here on the right and over here on the left, where you see virtually no galaxies, that's just because that's part of the universe we haven't finished mapping. So we don't see uh, these galaxies, th these regions filled with galaxies, because we simply haven't mapped galaxies in that part of the sky yet. But what I want to point out here is just, uh, again, because I kind of promised their cosmic microwave background, is the punchline to this, this, this sort of, uh, what started out as a simple concept of thinking about the uh, use of, of light travel time as kind of a cosmic yardstick. And that is, as we get farther from home, and now we're seeing farther out and we're seeing actually the bright cores of very young active galaxies here, what we call quasars, uh, this 3D map 
again, the punchline here is this, this cosmic microwave background, this is baby picture of the universe around us. And all of the, tell, all of, the uh, of the galaxies that you see here have been measured, have had their distances and locations measured by telescopes here on Earth. The cosmic microwave background was mapped by a satellite called Planck, named for a scientist who contributed to our, to our understanding of, uh, of the very smallest scales uh, in the universe. And I just want to point out there's yet another way that we use to study uh, the, uh, the universe, and that's kind of suggested by that name Planck. Planck studied microscopic scales. He was one of the pioneers of quantum mechanics. And that tiniest scale, weirdly enough, ends up influencing the universe writ large. So uh, I'm going to just want to end with one news story that's one of the more mind-bending ones this month. Um, I don't, before I then talk about our cosmic microwave background, we know that the universe is mostly matter, uh, at least uh, of, the, of, the, of the stuff that is matter is mostly matter, which I'm sorry, it's a little confusing. We have a universe made of uh, largely of dark energy, uh, of some part of dark matter, and then the kind of visible matter that we see. Now, the visible matter that we see only makes up about 4% of the universe, but uh, it's all matter and not antimatter. Now, antimatter, you may have heard of if you've watched old Star Trek episodes, it's that power source used for uh, the engines of these fictional spacecraft and what makes antimatter such a great sci-fi energy source is that when you combine antimatter and matter, uh, it they, they self-destruct and create energy. Now, the puzzle, one of the puzzles of the universe is that the matter that we see is mostly matter. We don't see much antimatter, but it's kind of the same stuff. Why would we have a universe made up mostly of matter and not antimatter? Or why wouldn't there be equal parts, except, of course, for the problem that, uh, that the interaction between matter and antimatter would uh, cause the two to uh, self-destruct. And just a recent observation uh, made by a group of physicists in the UK this month looked at, basically, weirdly enough, the shape of the nucleus of a particular atom. And their observation suggests that it's rather pear-shaped. Now, it turns out that the process that you could use to create a pear-shaped nucleus of an atom is potentially a solution to the reason why we have this disparity uh, between matter and antimatter. So I've talked about the spacecraft we sent out into the universe to explore. I've talked about the telescopes, whether in space or on Earth, that we use to explore the universe. It turns out that physics helps explore the tiniest scales in the universe and also illuminates what's happening at this largest scale, the structure of the universe writ large, and even the balance of what exists in the universe. Uh, so again, an interesting announcement from the UK this week, looking at the nuclei of specific atoms and understand, trying to understand how that could have shaped the distribution uh, the, of matter in the universe. And so leading into that then, our cosmic microwave background here that we see behind us uh, is sort of a different image from what I've shown earlier. It's a kind of a heat map of where stuff was in the early universe. And so regions that are bright are regions that are rather hot. Regions that are dark are regions that are, relatively speaking, kind of cool. And so that is a really high contrast image that we're using. This is the earliest light in the universe that dates back to when the universe was only a few hundred thousand years old. The universe is now 13.8 billion years old. And so now we're kind of confronting this, uh, this contrast between uh, the, uh, the looking out into space is looking back into time. That, that, the, that cosmic yardstick we've used since the beginning of the program is actually telling us what's happening very far back in time because looking out into space is looking back into time. Whether it's only a second and a half looking at the moon, eight minutes looking at the sun, or in the case of the cosmic microwave background, looking back in time almost 13.8 billion years. And this map of the hot and cool regions shows us the distribution of matter very early in the history of the universe. The dark blotches correspond to regions where there's more stuff. The hot, bright patches correspond to regions where there's less stuff. And that distribution of hot and cool stuff, of, of lots of stuff and not so much stuff, uh, that variation in density 
temperature and density in the early history of the universe actually gave rise to the structure of the universe that we saw close to home, that clumping and clustering of galaxies. So uh, this baby picture of the universe is kind of the punchline in terms of thinking about how light, which is this amazing tool that we use to discover objects very far from home, can also tell us about our distant past because it travels at a finite speed. And so when we look out into space, we look back in time, and we can actually see back toward the origin of our universe. So that's the punchline I wanted to kind of end with. Uh, I do want to mention, too, that one little distracting thing is that uh, it looks like we've ended up at the center of the universe, the way we're showing it. And uh, indeed, the way we're depicting things, we are at the center in the here and the now. But that's only because we're the ones drawing the picture. We've simply illustrated the distance from Earth of all of these objects. So we at the center end up at the center because we are the ones creating this three-dimensional map. So with that, let me go ahead and take us back home and hopefully with a little bit of time for questions as well, we'll fly back through our collection of uh, hundreds of thousands of galaxies that are clumped and clustered together. Uh, now with our color-coded galaxies closer to home, back toward the Milky Way, our own home with hundreds of billions of stars, past those planets forming the black holes, uh, lying far from home, and in toward our own star, the Sun, where we can highlight the orbits of the eight planets and zoom in to the third rock from the Sun, our own home planet, Earth. So, thank you for joining me on this uh, wild and wacky ride through the universe, <laughs> along with some of the latest uh, astronomical stories from uh, the past month. I uh, hope you enjoyed our, our universe update, and then um, uh, I'm more than happy to try to answer any questions you might have. Hey, Ryan, thank you. You're very welcome. That was fantastic. Um, the first question, um, well, wait, actually, and, I'll, and, I'll, and maybe you could just give a brief answer to this and I'll say, so the question is sure. from T, what is this software? It's awesome. And I will say that T, if you want, we will drop a link to Ryan's previous Breakfast Club talk in the comments because we talked a lot about the software um, there. But Ryan, if you want to give an easy answer, please go ahead. Sure. So this software happens to be something called Uniview, which is sort of a bespoke planetarium software platform that, uh, that Morrison Planetarium, many other planetariums around the world use. It's, um, it's not generally available for wide distribution, but there are some other really interesting uh, options and we'll add those to the comments. One of them is called Open Space. It's uh, still in its early days, but it is an open source uh, planetarium software, very similar to this. You can run on your home machine. You need a pretty good graphics card, but uh, you can look at some of the same data that we showed here. Uh, and you can get that same sense of how the, these different things are related to one another. So open space, if you go to openspaceproject.com, uh, that's, a, that's a great resource. And there's some other ones too. Worldwide Telescope is another great one. Uh, and we can share some of those in the, in the links uh, in the comments. Great. Thank you. Okay. So this question is from Mark H9. How many supernovas have happened in the history of humankind? Oh, that's an interesting one. History of humankind. Well, I guess it depends on where you want to start. Um, if we talk about humans as being, say, 150,000 years old, our species, um, if you talk about our galaxy, we think that supernovae occur about once every 100 years or so, mm -hmm. um, on average. Mm -hmm. Now, the galaxy, the universe has many, many galaxies. And so we're observing galaxies, all uh, galaxies, supernovae all the time in different galaxies. Right. And in fact, supernovae are one of the ways that we know that the, how the universe is expanding and that the, the expansion of the universe is accelerating. So uh, I would be hard pressed to put a number on um, the, uh, uh, on the number of supernovae that have occurred in the entire universe. But uh, in terms of our galaxy with hundreds of billions of stars, one a century for 150,000 years, you know, call it one and a half million or well, 15 million, if I can do my math right. Yeah. I'm impressed no matter that just that you tried. So thank you. <laughs> um, Aaron asked, what causes the great red spot storm? And is it always in the same place? That's a great question. So the, the great red spot is, uh, I mean, it's one of the reasons why uh, astronomers are looking so closely at Jupiter is to understand how these these storms are maintained and how the how the energy works in these systems 
because uh, I mean, the short answer is we don't really know why mm. the great red spot could persist for basically as long as humans have had telescopes. So mm. hundreds of years and it's maybe shrinking, but it's still pretty big. You know, you could fit one and a half Earths in it. So um, so the short answer is we're, we're not really sure. I think we can, I'm safe in saying, um, but we're trying very hard to understand And Understanding that means understanding all of the dynamics of the uh of the jupiter system right. we see other storms that last for like months but the gray red spot has persisted you know like i said for hundreds of years and that's a bit of a puzzle yeah cool i like a puzzle um this one is from dana and she asked it around the time you mentioned the um the hawaiian name which yes. was impressive and she asked is the person who discovers an object also the one who gets to name it um that's oh that's a really interesting and kind of convoluted question Sort of, yes. Um, <laughs> basically, if you discover an object, you get you get sort of dibs at recommending a name. Mm -hmm. Now, the International Astronomical Union, probably most famous for being the group that uh, reclassified Pluto back in 2006, the International Astronomical Union decides on names, and they're kind of naming conventions and things like that for different kinds of objects. What is interesting, and the reason that, um, uh, and, and now I've, I've not kept it in my brain long enough, but uh, okay, Okay, I'm all, uh, 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 let me just cheat. Okay, Epa Oka Awala uh, has its name is because it was discovered in Hawaii. And many Hawaiian astronomers have kind of agreed that they are going to promote using names derived from the um, Hawaiian language as a way of kind of honoring the, the space where they do their work. So mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the specific name, Ka, just means the... It means um, actually like mischief maker or something along those lines. Oh, uh, Ka'awala. Ka'awala is the name for Jupiter. So basically, because it's in this orbit that is related to Jupiter, but going in the wrong way, the name kind of reflects like sort of this mischief maker related to Jupiter. It's a fantastic so, name. Yeah. yeah. I also like the idea of like a sci-fi feature where people are blasting by things named for all right. these disparate places all over yes. Earth. Um, so Ben, this is, okay, so Ben says, or uh, slash asks, you see so many artist illustrations in space news, and I know they trigger a lot of people who somehow don't believe we actually even go to or explore space. Can you please clarify how rigorous the science is that have, informs those illustrations? That's a, that's a tremendous question and something that I, um, I, I love to talk about at length, so I'll see if I can keep my answer short. So some things, um, we know what they look like. And I think what's interesting as we've explored our solar system, it's easy to go back at, to space art from like the um, from the 70s and say, oh, well, you know, we can do better than that. We know what we actually know what these places look like. Mm -hmm. And so what I think space art is great at doing is, is providing a way of stretching the imagination. And so the same way that those artists in the 60s and 70s or even back into the 50s uh, helped us imagine what space would look like these objects that we're never going to be able to take, we're never going to be able to take an image of Lumen 16A. But um, these illustrations help us kind of think about what they would look like. And I think they inspire us to, um, uh, to, to, to imagine what these places are like. And in, in the case of the, the Lumen 16A illustration, um, I know the people who worked on it, they worked very closely with the researchers to talk about like, well, what would the number of bands look like? And uh, what, what is it? Uh, what's the distribution on the surface of the of the brown dwarf? So they go to a lot of trouble to make sure that they're correct. And, and for example, the the black hole simulation that I showed of the black hole in orbiter with the other star, we don't know exactly what the arrangement is, but we got those orbit uh, characteristics from the researchers, and and basically we have constraints, and we use those to illustrate as best we can. So uh, I would say that a lot of people are doing it very responsibly. Uh, but there are certainly occasions when I look at the artist's conception and kind of like, eh, yeah, it's not, I don't think that's what it looked like <laughs> at all. <laughs> yeah, and I imagine there's a range, but if you see something that's coming out and accompanying like a press release yeah. from NASA or another space agency or yeah. something like that, you can, those NASA, are probably... Mm -hmm. NASA does great work. Um, I, I have quibbles with some of those, but uh, the European uh, Southern Observatory, ESO, uh, has, uh, and they were actually the ones who worked on the the black hole simulation and animation. There's one animation that I'll link to uh, in the universe update notes. Um, those are deeply informed by the science. So there's some really great uh, artists working on this. Great, thank you. Uh, Carlos asks, what is the oldest human-made object in space today? 
Oh, that's a great question. Um, I'm not sure. I should probably. Um, uh, I should probably answer more accurately than comments, but off the top of my head, the earliest satellites that I, I think have stayed in orbit are from around 1962 or mm -hmm. so. Um, and actually I have some colleagues on the Morrison Planetarium staff who know space stuff better than I, okay. but roughly, so roughly 50, 60 years. Okay, cool. Uh, JC, age 12, asks, what's the next manned mission being planned to go to space and where will it go? That's a great question. And right now, most of the conversations around where to go are actually around humans going back to the moon. And the moon, first of all, it's close. It's the easiest place to get to. Um, so far, only 12 people have actually set foot on the moon, although about 24 people have, have orbited the moon. Uh, and that was all more than 50 years ago now, or not all, more than, but 50-ish years ago. Mm -hmm. And so um, we're talking about going back in part because it's the obvious place to go. It's, it's the most accessible, but there's also really great science, a lot of things that we can learn uh, by going back to the moon, including perhaps ways that we can help uh, the situation here on Earth with some resources from the moon. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and there are, there's sort of American missions that are planned. Uh, as far as I know, uh, the Chinese are also planning, uh, Space Agency is also planning a mission. Uh, and uh, that's what I know off the top of my head, but mm -hmm. there are some people who know even more mm -hmm. than I do, so we can check with them as well. Mm -hmm. I guess it's important for any exploration that we just get good at doing it, get good at yeah. going to a stop and right. that sort of thing. perfect, yeah. Yeah, does it actually play a role in, um, I've seen it kind of linked to, or be as linked to Mars colonization or things like right. that as a stop. Does it actually play a functional role in that potentially? It does. I mean, if we, so, you know, the trip to the moon took about, four days, three and a half, four days, uh, when we did it back in the 60s and 70s. We can probably decrease that amount of time somewhat, but uh, maybe not significantly. Um, there are a couple interesting things. Because the gravitational pull of the moon is not as great as the gravitational pull of Earth, if you set up a base on the moon, it would be easier to launch stuff, for example, to mm -hmm. Mars or to asteroids, to launch them from the moon than from mm -hmm. Earth. So uh, it could be a great waypoint. Um, there's hydrogen and oxygen on, on the moon. We could use that uh, to create both water and rocket fuel. So there are a lot of interesting ways that the that the moon could kind of be a, a launching off point uh, for uh, for further uh, space exploration. Cool. Uh, okay, I'll ask you just a couple more here. Sure. Um, Renee would like to know whether the black hole discovered close to Earth poses any actual danger to us. We're pretty safe. So not only is it about a thousand light years away uh, and not traveling toward us, <laughs> it's uh, black holes are, you know, they have a bad rap. Uh, I could just blame the Disney movie from the 70s, which I, evidently has has gotten a lot of traction on Disney Plus since they oh. launched it. Um, but uh, but black holes don't sort of kind of race through space like giant vacuum cleaners gobbling things up. Um, they're they're really pretty well confined. I mean, to get all physicsy about it, the um, if your if your eyes are closed, you look at a gravitational uh, the gravitational attraction of an object. You can't necessarily tell if it's a black hole if you're far enough away from it, as opposed to a star or anything else. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it's really they're 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 maligned entities within the cosmos, mm -hmm. I think, um, and we're we're pretty safe. Okay, well, if they're maligned, then I immediately have sympathy for them. So. I'm on Black Hole, Team Black Hole. Team Black Hole, yeah. Um, also, Josh Roberts, who's one of our planetarium presenters, just weighed in to say Vanguard 1 is still up there, which was launched in 1958. Okay. So well, it's an additional data point. Uh, data point. Sorry, like Star Trek Next Generation messed up a whole like generation of kids as far as data data goes. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so I like this last one is from Nicole, who is a third grader. Or it's from Nicole's third grader, sorry. Um, is outer space the same as regular space? And part two, how many galaxies do we know of? That's great. Um, so yeah, outer space, space, we kind of, I mean, um, we, we sort of use them interchangeably. Um, I think it would, it, you know, it was, this just came up recently because we're looking at like deep space is the name of something and deep for, uh, anyway. So <laughs> it's space, it's way out. Um, the, uh, the question about galaxies is uh, is fascinating because they're kind of the galaxies that we've actually observed. And then there's kind of our estimate of the total number. Mm -hmm. So we estimate that within the observable universe, there are hundreds of billions of galaxies. So 
give or take, it's like for every star in our galaxy, in our, in our own Milky Way, there's probably a whole other galaxy right. out to be observed in our observable universe. And then most of those are too far away, too faint for us to actually observe directly. So it's an estimate of the total number. Mm -hmm. um, the, the surveys that I showed, where we're actually showing the locations of the, of the galaxies, we've roughly, we've cataloged about the locations of about a million galaxies. So if you compare 1 million to 100 billion, we've got a lot of ways, long ways to go, uh, but we're, well, we're working on it. Yeah, cool. Um, well, thank you so much. And I know before I tell folks about what's coming up on Breakfast Club, I know you have some things you'd like to share where they can kind of see more space. Right. So I didn't actually, I mentioned it in uh, when we were visiting Lumen 16A, that brown dwarf, but uh, Jackie Verity, who's a brown dwarf expert from the American Museum of Natural History in New York, is going to be in a cosmic conversation with me tomorrow at 1130 a.m. Pacific on the Morrison Planetarium Facebook page. And so that's a chance for us to just sort of chat using the same software that I was using today uh, and talk a little bit about uh, a specific topic. So um, Jackie is a, is a tremendous, entertaining uh, presenter. So I'm sure we'll have a lot to chat about. And if you are interested in these kind of mysterious brown dwarfs, these sort of failed stars, she's the, the person to ask. That sounds really cool. And we will drop a link to the Morrison Facebook page in comments on both platforms so people can be sure not to miss that. Um, and then before we sign off, I will let you know a few Breakfast Club things happening. So June 2nd, we are kicking off Pride Month by bringing back Dr. Lauren Esposito, who is our curator of arachnology, as well as the founder of 500 Queer Scientists, which despite the 500, is actually a community of over 10,000 people and 1,000 individual science contributors. Uh, and she's going to talk about why it's so critical to ensure that science welcomes and involves everyone and some of the data, be data behind that. Um, and then on June 8th, we're celebrating World Oceans Day with a panel of five scientists who will be giving mini talks on everything from reefs to sharks to new innovations and discoveries and then taking all the questions that you can ask. Um, and then last two things. So this Tuesday, May 22nd, we're going to bring on our collections registrar, Lindsay Palima, who's going to take people behind the scenes and kind of show you a bit about what it takes to take care of, to care for all of these thousands and thousands of scientific collections at the Academy. And then tonight, 7 p.m. right back here. Please return for night school where Ryan will again be appearing, but um, with a different kind of presentation. And it'll, I, yeah, can't wait for that either. So again, thank you so much. We will see you next month. And um, yeah, until tonight. All right, thanks. Bye everyone. Take care. <laughs>